Today we're going to be dealing with uh, the expansion of Italy in the 1930s, and, and we're really following the same pattern that we did with Japan, uh, but now we're just doing them with, with Italy and Germany. So we've already talked uh, last week about the rise of fascism in, in Italy in the 1920s. Then we talked about the rise of Nazism in Germany in the 19, early 1930s. Now we're going back to Italy and we're going to deal with now a fascist government in Italy in the 1930s uh, exercising aggressive actions towards others in its, in its, uh, in its uh, world. And uh, then we'll go back and talk about Germany and how they become an aggressive power. And then for both of them, we'll talk about the international reactions uh, to these aggressive actions. But to start with, with Italy. First, we need to remember uh, a few of the important ideas about what the fascist ideology believed, and that was a glorification of war, a glorification of war, that war is a good for a nation. The fascists believed that imperial expansion would, would increase national pride for, for the country. And, of course, they were anti-internationalists. So war is good, imperialism is good, internationalism is bad. The story in Japan will, or pardon me, the story in Italy will really reflect the same ideas that we saw with the Japan story, where Japan in the 1920s played the internationalist game. Italy in the 1920s plays the internationalist game. And then the Great Depression hits. For Japan, that pushes Japan to be an aggressive power and make a move against Manchuria. For Italy, it will push Italy to be an aggressive power and make a move to grow its own empire. So when the Great Depression hits, Italy will lose outside investors, in particular the United States. American investment banks who were pumping some money into Italy so Italy could grow, they'll lose that. Grain prices will be, be crushed in Italy, hurting Italian farmers, which really echoes the story we saw in Japan. What, what commodity in Japan will see its prices plummet? The, the silk production in, in Japan, when silk prices crash, the silk, worker, silk working industry um, is destroyed. Unemployment will be on the rise in Italy through the years of the early Great Depression. Mussolini will attempt to distract the population from this economic crisis by fostering this, this uh, spirit of fascist uh, revolution, this revolutionary spirit in Italy. The hope that Italy can become a self-sufficient autarky. This is a word that pops up in your standards. You should be familiar with it. Autarky, like auto, like doing it yourself. Autarky is a government that is self-sufficient, an economy that is self-sufficient. It's the same thing that Japan was looking for, right? They didn't want to have to rely on countries that could merely cut off oil or cut off steel from them. They want to become self-sufficient. And foreign wars, expansion of an Italian empire, can work to create this Italian autarky. If Italy can gain more overseas territories, they would have to rely less on foreign nations to trade with. And also, victory in overseas wars will make Italians feel proud of their country and lead to more support of their government. So now we're going to talk about a few steps of Italian foreign policy in the 1930s, uh, beginning with a 1934 agreement between Italy, Germany, Britain, and France called the Four Power Pact. The Four Power Pact. I wish we had better names for all these agreements than the Five Power Agreement or the Nine Power Agreement. Um, but, anywho, the 1933 Four Power Pact puts Germany and Italy and Britain and France in an agreement that their opinions should outweigh those of smaller European nations that the smaller European nations should have less say, for example, in the League of Nations, than these four powers. It's basically saying the four big countries will stand together to maybe block some ideas or interests of the smaller European nations. 
This ultimately doesn't go very far. It doesn't do much. It, the French parliament doesn't even ratify it. But it allows Benito Mussolini to feel like he's a part of the major powers of, of Europe at the time. The Four Power Pact. In Austria, in July of 1934, in a, in a brief time out here, uh, really quick, today we're, talk, we're focusing on Italy. On Tuesday, we're going to focus on Germany. These stories really are intertwined. So when I'm talking about some of this, uh, it might not be crystal clear today until we make it through the German story. So by the time we get to Tuesday, we're going to talk about a lot of these things again. At that point, it, a lot of light bulbs should be going off and this should be crystal clear. So for now, I want to remind us of a situation in Austria uh, before World, or pardon me, after World War I. Italy in the south, in the Mediterranean. Germany in the north. Austria, the new nation of Austria, is wedged right between the two of them. And Austria is a landlocked nation that lacks in resources and industry. All right? So Austria, maybe from the beginning of its creation, might have hoped to become a part of the German nation. And for Germany's part, they might have hoped Austria could be absorbed into Germany, making Germany even bigger. But the Treaty of Versailles and the Treaty of Saint-Germain didn't allow that, right? What do we call that political union between Austria and Germany? Anschluss. Anschluss, right? Right up here. Anschluss. The Treaty of Saint-Germain and the Treaty of Versailles said no Anschluss. Nobody wanted to see a bigger, more powerful Germany, all right? In 1934, Adolf Hitler comes to power in Germany. We talked about this the other day. He merges the offices of the presidency and, and the uh, chancellor into one position that he calls their, their Führer, right? In the summer of 1934, an Austrian prime minister, or an Austrian chancellor, I should say, is shot and killed in an assassination perpetrated by Austrian Nazis. Austrian Nazis kill the Austrian chancellor. He has the unfortunate name of Engelbert Dolphus. You guys are cool. Eh, it's the kind of name that you might end up getting picked on in elementary school, I, I would think. But maybe not in, in Austria in 1934. Um, so Engelbert Dolphus, D-O-L-L-F-U-S-S, -S, is shot and killed in Austria by Austrian Nazis. Now, if you know anything about what's going on in the world in 1934, who might you think has a hand to play in the killing of Engelbert Dolphus? German Nazis. Adolf Hitler, possibly. And in 1934, we're going to get a clear example of where Germany is and where Italy is. Because in 1934, Italy does not want to see an Austria and a Germany becoming one. They don't want to see an Anschluss take place. They don't want a powerful Germany just to its north. They like having Austria in between. In, in uh, international relations, Austria is what we might call a buffer state. It's a state that's in between two other states that might not be in, in total agreement with each other. A buffer state would keep them safe. That's like Austria today, in some ways. I would say the demilitarized zone is like a buffer between North and South Korea. Um, are you saying North Korea is kind of a buffer between China and South Korea? Yeah, in some ways, especially during the Cold War. Sure. Okay, I'll, I'll take that. I'll take that. Um, so Dolphus is assassinated, and with this assassination, Benito Mussolini will mobilize his army. To mobilize your army means to get them ready to fight. And he sends them to his northern border, his border with Austria, as a show of strength to the Germans, who might possibly be thinking of moving into Austria, or Nazis, that might possibly get support from Germany to topple the government of Austria. And with this show of strength, Germany stands down. Germany makes no move on Austria in 1934. Hitler does not intervene in this Austrian political crisis after that assassination. So we have in 1934 a picture where Benito Mussolini and Adolf Hitler are not seeing eye to eye with each other. They're not necessarily on the same page. They're not in support of each other. 
Mussolini's doing his thing down in Italy, and whose interests do Mussolini care about? Does Mussolini care about? Italian, his own, Italian interests. And, of course, Adolf Hitler cares about German interests. That's where we are in 1934. In 1935, Adolf Hitler will begin a rearmament program. He begins to rebuild his military. Again, we'll talk about this more in a couple days. But what did the Treaty of Versailles say about Adolf Hitler's military? Small. 100,000 soldiers, no air force, no submarines, a limited navy, right? So he's not allowed to do this according to the Treaty of Versailles. But he begins. Now, you'll often hear people talk about secretly rearming. It's not really a secret. People know it's happening. They just don't do anything about it. But if you're Benito Mussolini, a little bit concerned about what Germany might be up to, and Germany starts rearming, and you think Germany might one day want to go to Austria, and then that would put Germany on your northern border, you might not be too keen on Germany rearming. In response to this, in April 1935, Germany, or pardon me, in April 1935, Britain and France and Italy, and here we can see Benito Mussolini in the middle, Britain and France and Italy will meet and form what is called the Stresa Front. Stresa, S-T-R-E-S-A. I guess you can see it right there. The Stresa Front. The Stresa Front is essentially an agreement between Britain and France and Italy to maintain the status quo with Germany. Status quo means? Same thing. Keep things the same. Keep things the same. Let's not let Germany grow to be an aggressive power. They hope to maintain the status quo, keep things the same, keep Germany from violating the Treaty of Versailles further. All right? The Stresa Front is going to be really short-lived. But what it does in the immediate is it lets Benito Mussolini take a sigh of relief. Whew! Don't have to worry about Germany right now. And now that he doesn't have to worry about Germany, he can turn his attention away from his north down to the far south. Yes? There are four people there. You said people in France. Yes, I don't know who those four people are. I wish I knew right now, but it's been a long time since I put that on there. So... I would imagine one country has two, or maybe Switzerland's there too. I don't know. Um, I'd have to, I want to look at a picture of when I'm done here. Uh, April of 1935. So now, Germany and, and Italy, it seems like Italy can, can be safe from Germany because they got Britain and France on their side. So they're comfortable now on their northern border. They don't have to have an army mobilized on their north anymore. Now we can look towards the south, and this is where Italy will look to Abyssinia or Ethiopia. And now we're going to talk about what is known as the Abyssinian Crisis in 1935 and 1936. Ethiopia in 1935 is one of two independent nations in Africa. The other being in West Africa, anyone? Maybe no? You got it. Liberia, Liberia. very good, yeah. No, it's an independent nation. It's not ours. Yeah, they, they run themselves. It was created, founded by freed American slaves, uh, but it's not an independent, it's not a colony of the United States. Ethiopia in East Africa is one of the oldest civilizations in, in Africa, and it maintained its independence through the early 20th century. In fact, back in the 1890s, the Italians tried to take Ethiopia, and they failed. They were defeated in what was called the Battle of Adawa and the First Italian-Ethiopian War. So the Italians were defeated back in the 1890s. And so moving into Ethiopia in the 1930s would do a lot of things for Italy. It would expand their empire. It would gain more support from Benito Mussolini's regime. If the people back home can start waving their Italian flags because they've conquered territory, they'll feel good. They'll be in support of Mussolini. It will avenge the earlier defeat in Abyssinia. It will gain colonial troops for future conflicts. Do you guys remember the stories in World War I where every single country that had a colony, had every single country that had an empire, used its colonial soldiers to fight? 
So, like, there were black Africans fighting on the Western Front for France. There were Indians fighting on the Western Front for Britain. Um, so this would provide colonial soldiers for future conflicts. And what all, what all empires can provide is, is markets for Italian products. So it would be give new export markets for Italian products. In December 1934, this conflict begins around an oasis known as Wall Wall in southeastern Ethiopia. Now, this was in Ethiopia, but an Italian regiment, Italian troops, began to build a fort in Wall Wall. This is not making the Ethiopians very happy. And in December of 1934, it comes to a head, and a, a small, uh, small violence, small level of violence erupts between Italian soldiers and Ethiopian soldiers. Thirty Italians will be killed. Benito Mussolini demands an apology from Ethiopia and immediate compensation. While the Ethiopian uh, emperor, a man named Haile Selassie I, you guys can see his name up here, Haile Selassie I will refuse. And he calls upon the League of Nations to investigate. Benito Mussolini refuses to support any League of Nations action against himself. Shocking. Uh, and so uh, he responds to Haile Selassie's request for this investigation with an outright invasion of Ethiopia. This will come uh, in the next year, in October of 1935. 500,000 Italian troops will invade Ethiopia. The League of Nations condemns this invasion. They put some economic sanctions onto Italy, but Italy continues. This picture here is from the uh, Ethiopian uh, Emperor Haile Selassie at the League of Nations. He goes there to plead his case for support from the League of Nations. It's, it's the thing the League of Nations was put together to do. But of course the League of Nations will do much the same that they did with Japan and Manchuria, and that is nothing. In May of 1936, the capital of Ethiopia, a city called Addis Ababa, Right in the center of Ethiopia. In May of 1936, the capital will fall, be taken by the Italians. And a few days later, on the 9th of May, 1936, Italy will annex Ethiopia. They will take it over outright. They will claim it as their own. And again, the League of Nations does nothing. Yeah? Wait, so Eritrea and Italian Somalia are just colonies. Right? These were already colonies of Italy from the, 19, from the uh, late 1900s, late 19th century. You mean now they've made it colonies. They've made it all colonies. They've made it all colonies. If you look at like where the British colonies are, they're almost in a straight line just Ethiopia from, is yeah, to build to build a railroad from north yeah. to south. Yeah, they absolutely. Is but they've got a straight line down here. So they don't really need that. So anyhow, uh, the League of Nations doesn't do much of anything to this, and I Italy has now added Abyssinia or Ethiopia, same thing. Uh, to their African empire. The results of this invasion. Comparatively few Italian losses. All right? it's, it's costly, but nothing compared to what the Ethiopians deal with. And, and one note. The fascist government of Italy said they lost about a thousand guys. Modern historical scholarship says the number was probably 10,000. Why would the fascists so have underreported the amount that got killed in this conflict? Yeah. They like war. They want to keep public support high. They want to make it look like this was an easy fight. Yeah. It, it very, very well could be. Yeah. So, so there was a vested interest. So we, we sometimes have to be, a, um, just because we see numbers written down in a chart doesn't mean they're real doesn't mean they're, they're verified. doesn't mean there's any kind of accuracy to them. Sometimes governments have a vested interest 
to not share all the numbers, uh, to not tell the complete story. For the Ethiopians, it is far more devastating. Upwards of three quarters of a million casualties in this war that lasts only a year. About 7% of the uh, Ethiopian population is either killed or wounded in this, uh, in this war, many of them being civilians. The Italians used poison gas, mustard gas, the same gases that were used on the Western Front during World War I. The Italians will spray them on the Ethiopian uh, population. This will increase tensions between Britain and, uh, and Italy. If you remember, the Straits of Front was just born, where Italy and Britain and France will kind of stand together. But now Italy launches a war in, in Africa, right? Now, we've got some stuff going on here. This map is not perfect for our purposes, but see, what, what body of water is this? This is not a great map because there's a huge chunk of land that we can't see right here. What body of water is this? Red sea. That's the Red Sea. The Red Sea is connected to the Mediterranean Sea via a narrow man-made channel called the Suez Canal. Very good. If you are a British subject, or if you are the, the government of Britain, you need safe and free passage through the Mediterranean Sea, through the Suez, through the Red Sea, into what's called the Gulf of Aden, on your way to India. That is of vital importance to you and your empire. And so a war in East Africa might threaten that. And Britain wasn't too fond of this operation. So the friendship that might have grown between Britain and Italy with the Straits of Front is now broken. Yeah? Didn't Britain and France, through the formal battle pact, said that, okay, um, Italy, you can go ahead and destroy Ethiopia? They, they, they got, yes. There, there was an agreement. That, that it wasn't so much that you could destroy Ethiopia, uh, but it was allowing them to move into portions of it. But the outright conquering of the entirety, uh, I don't think was in the cards. I don't think it was in the cards. Did France and Britain want Italy to do that? No, but they didn't want to stop it. They didn't want to do anything to necessarily stop it. But they didn't want a protracted war. So, this is the end of the Straits of Front. All right? This, for Italy, is a costly war. Not so much in terms of man manpower, but certainly finances. It is a hugely expensive war. Even while the Italians so outnumbered uh, or at least outpowered the Ethiopians in this fight. Uh, one note, Italy went into this war with uh, over 595 airplanes and 795 tanks compared to four planes and 13 tanks, or flip that, 13 planes and four tanks that the Ethiopians had had. So Ethiopia was far outnumbered in military power by their Italian counterparts, but... Italy's still got to get all that stuff down there. And they're putting all those weapons of war into action. And even though the Ethiopians are defeated and they lose their country, they won't stop fighting. What kind of fighting do you think they turn into? If now we've, we see the beginning of a guerrilla campaign in Ethiopia, where Ethiopians will continue to fight the Italians for the next five years. All right? And that's how those numbers of Italian dead will rise to uh, around about 10,000. So they've got to deal with this now in Abyssinia. The League of Nations, another result of the Abyssinian crisis, the League of Nations will prove itself to be impotent in the face of an aggressive nation. In fact, they've already proven that with the Manchurian crisis, but now this is uh, emphasized again that the League of Nations really doesn't want to act in the face of an aggressive nation. And with the Straits of Front falling apart, with Italy losing an alliance with, Brent, uh, with Britain and France, they will move closer to the German nation. Italy will agree to support German rearmament. Italy agrees to support German... Uh, remilitarization of the Rhineland. We're going to talk about all these things in a couple days. And Italy agrees that Austria can become a satellite of Germany. Just two years before, Italy didn't want to see that happening. Now Italy is okay with it. Why? Because they don't have any friends anymore. Yeah? You said satellite. 
satellite. Yeah, they're not down. They're not down with Anschluss necessarily, but they're okay with with Germany and Austria being linked up. Next, we're going to talk about the Spanish Civil War. Um, very brief background to the Spanish Civil War, all right, because that's not really the purpose of this class. In the late 1930s, there was a civil war in Spain. That is the bare minimum that you need to know. In the late 1930s, there was a civil war in Spain. It pitted two sides, and within those sides, there were various factions. The main two sides are what we call the Republicans, it was like the government of Spain, and then the nationalists. And some of the main factions within the Republican wing were communists. Like the Soviet Union put a lot of support into the Republican faction in the Spanish Civil War. Which is part of the reason that Britain and France and even the United States don't really want to get too involved with what's going on in Spain because that would be like siding with, with communists and that wasn't cool for us. On the other side of the equation, the nationalists, their biggest faction was led by a man named Francisco Franco and he was a fascist. All right, Francisco Franco, he was a fascist. When civil war breaks out in, in Spain in 1936, Benito Mussolini sees this as an opportunity to spread fascist ideology. Benito Mussolini sees this as an opportunity to spread fascist ideology. And he will offer more support into the Spanish Civil War on either side than any other country will during the duration of this fight. He sends over 70,000 Italian soldiers to go and fight in Spain. This brings huge economic costs onto Italy and a depletion of their military. Now, this is back-to-back -back wars that Italy's fighting, right? They're fighting in Abyssinia, where they send 500,000 guys. They're fighting in, in Spain, where they send nearly 100,000 men. So these are two big conflicts that Italy gets itself involved with. Can I, can I call a brief time out? Did you guys catch um, a few weeks ago, Donald Trump made a little speech about our, our role in Afghanistan and where we were talking about uh, increasing our troop presence in Afghanistan. Did anybody catch how many troops we, we had and how many we were going to add? We're talking about sending another 4,000 troops. We've got about 5,000 there. So we talk about sending another 4,000 troops in Afghanistan. So, like, around about 10,000 guys in the country of Afghanistan. That's not a lot of guys. And I think hearing those numbers puts into perspective the massive numbers that we're dealing with here in the 1930s, right? So these are huge economic costs. And now we've got a situation that's starting to grow in relationship between Germany and Italy. Back in 1934, when, when Engelbert Dolphus was killed, Italy had a pretty strong military. Germany was comparatively weak. Adolf Hitler's just coming to power. And then Italy goes into Abyssinia, and their military is being expended. And then Italy goes into the Spanish Civil War. Now, to be sure, Germany is going to join in the Spanish Civil War too, but just with some air force. And they're not going to really lose a lot in this fight. So Italy is losing a lot of men in the Spanish Civil War and huge costs. All the while, Germany is rebuilding their military. So it shouldn't surprise us that in 1934, Italy mobilizes its army on their northern border and Germany stands down. But by 1936 and 37, the roles have been reversed. And Italy is recognizing that Germany is now the powerhouse in Europe. And so Germany and Italy will begin to form a closer relationship. On the 25th of October of 1936, Benito Mussolini and Adolf Hitler will sign what's called the Rome-Berlin Axis. The Rome-Berlin Axis. The planet revolves, the Earth revolves on its axis. Everything goes around that axis. It's the idea, if you draw a line between Rome and Berlin and Europe, everything else surrounds it. Everything else is on the periphery. Everything else has to answer to Rome and Berlin. Yeah? Did Francisco Franco won the war? Yes. Why did he join to make a Rome-Berlin 
Because he was, this, this war, the war is going to be protracted. It's going to last until, I think, 1938, 39. Uh, so the war is lasting for, for longer. And this was a bloody and violent and brutal civil war for, for Spain. Uh, they end up staying neutral during the Second World War. They kind of stay out of it. They have nothing to give to that fight. But it's not a country that will join against the fascist powers or, or the Nazi powers. So they don't join the war on either side. Um, in the next year, 1937, Italy and Germany and now Japan join together in what is called the anti comintern Pact. We will talk about Comintern a little bit later in the year. But Comintern is Communist International. The Communist International. The International Communist Movement as directed by Moscow. With a goal of spreading communism to other nations of the world. So Japan and Italy and Germany all joined together in the anti comintern Pact. This is a couple years before the Tripartite Pact, where they all signed the three-party pact, where they sign a, a military alliance with each other. This is just the three of them making their first agreement against, to stand against the spread of international communism. In December of 1937, Italy leaves the League of Nations. What good is the League of Nations if a nation can violate the sovereignty of other countries, and when the League of Nations objects, they just leave. They just quit, and there's no repercussions. So we are now completely seeing the weakness of the League of Nations as a collective security organization. In 1938, in 1938, and we'll talk about this in a couple days, Germany will invade Austria to execute the Anschluss, this union between Austria and Germany. They will put Germany and Austria together into one country. Italy doesn't stop them. Italy supports this move. So it's an annex? Uh, they essentially annex Austria. It becomes a part of Germany. Italy will also give support to the nation of Germany when it comes to a region of Czechoslovakia called the Sudetenland. It's pretty sweet. Sec second class, I've already got it all prepared. Uh, a, uh, this, this western portion of Czechoslovakia. We're going to talk a lot about Czechoslovakia in our next class. Uh, it's a very tricky word for a lot of students to write. If you can master the Czech part, everything else is easy. So Czech is C-Z-E-C-H. And then everything else is phonetic, O Slovakia. So Czechoslovakia is a new country made after World War I. Mostly carved out of Austria-Hungary, but some of it comes from Germany. And in this new Czechoslovakia, the western region, western border is called the Sudetenland. And there were large German populations in the Sudetenland region of Czechoslovakia. We'll talk about it in a couple days, but for, to make the long story short right now, Hitler wanted it. Europe wanted to avoid war. So Benito Mussolini threw together a meeting to be held in Munich, Germany, called the Munich Conference. And out of the Munich Conference, Britain and France and Italy and Germany all agreed that Germany can take the Sudetenland as long as the rest of Czechoslovakia is left alone. Italy supported that. So this is Germany growing bigger. Again, I know this is a lot happening really fast. It will make much more sense when we go back over and do it again when we talk about this from a German perspective. For today, we just want to see how Italy now is looking up at a growing German power. Right? A few months later, Germany violates the Munich Pact. They were told, don't mess with Czechoslovakia, the rest of it. Germany violated, invaded Czechoslovakia. The entirety of Czechoslovakia. This was Adolf Hitler's first conquest, not of greater Germany, a Germany for German-speaking people. They've already been doing that. This is his first conquest of Lebensraum, creating the living space for his German people. When Adolf Hitler violates the Munich Pact and moves into Czechoslovakia, now all rules are off the table, right? Because what did the world do when Adolf Hitler took Czechoslovakia? Nothing. Nothing. You shouldn't do that, Germany. That's about it. They did nothing. So Italy, for its part, 
will move into Albania. Italy will move into Albania. If you recall, we talked about Albania last week. In fact, let, let me show you that map real quick. You've got to go way back here. 1938. Got to get all the way back up to our map. There we go. Here is Italy. There is Albania. Albania was already a, a, a friend of Italy's. They had this treaty of friendship. It was kind of a protectorate of Italy. Italy was looking out for Albania. Really, what Italy wanted was a footprint in the Balkan Peninsula. And so when Hitler moves into Czechoslovakia, Italy will make its move into Albania. The king of Albania, who has the totally awesome name of King Zog, will flee Albania. And in order to not be completely overrun by the Italian military, the Albanian parliament will concede and give in. And a fascist government is going to be created in Italy. Or, pardon me, in Albania. Albania essentially becomes a puppet state of Italy. In May of 1939, in May of 1939, Germany and Italy will sign the Pact of Steel. Germany and Italy will sign the Pact of Steel, which will unite... German and, mil and, and Italian military uh, operations. Uh, yes, that is. So with the Pact of Steel, now Germany and Italy are not just having a defensive alliance with each other like they did with the Rome-Berlin axis. Now they are actually coordinating their military plans. By this point, Germany is preparing for the Second World War. Italy is not ready yet. Why would Germany be getting ready to fight a war, but Italy's not ready to go? Yeah, Germany wasn't fighting much. Italy fought in Ethiopia. Italy fought in Spain. So Italy lets it be known that they're not ready to start a war yet. But Adolf Hitler is not working by the Italian timeline. And on September 1st, 1939... Germany will jump in and invade Poland beginning World War II in Europe. September 1st, 1939, Germany will invade Poland to start World War II in Europe. Mussolini does not move. Nineteen thirty nine comes to an end. Mussolini still hasn't joined a war. The months pass. Mussolini still hasn't joined the war, and it's starting to look bad for him. As Adolf Hitler begins conquering Poland and then starting to move to the west of Europe and moving into France, Mussolini has to now worry that the war might pass him by, that this war could come to an end without Mussolini ever making a move, and then Germany will have it all. So in June of 1940... Benito Mussolini will finally jump in and join their ally, Germany, in the Second World War. 1940, June of 1940. Italian troops in Libya. This is an Italian colony in North Africa. Italian troops in Libya will invade into the British holdings in Egypt. So war will go to, to North Africa first for the Italians. They will attack the British army in Egypt. What's the British army doing in Egypt? The defending, the, defending the Suez Canal. Defending their canal. That's the lifeline between British shipping, uh, uh, the British Isles, and, uh, and India. And then Italian armies will move from Albania in the Balkan Peninsula to attack Greece. So now Italy fighting in North Africa, Italy fighting in the Balkan Peninsula, Italy is now in the Second World War. When did they invade Greece? Uh, they invaded Greece uh, in 1940, after June of 1940, from Albania. This will be a disaster for the Italians on both fronts. The Italians will, be, uh, will not be able to defeat the British in North Africa, and they will not be able to overrun Greece, 
And so the Germans will be bailing out the Italians in both cases. We'll talk about this as we get into the Second World War, uh, but now I think we're all good with how Italy gets into the fight.